Perrin Road will end and you will make a left on Maple Road. You will be passing through field and forest. The landscape on Maple Road has changed since colonial times and reflects its change in use. The woods along the route were all tobacco fields a few decades ago. If you take note of the foliage, you will notice that the loblolly and Virginia pines are relatively small in size. Some are tiny and the hardwoods among them are quite young. Woods now obscure whole settlements, communities, and farmsteads that were related to the cultivation of tobacco. As we drive down, take note of the farms on your right, one of which is still owned and worked by the Perrin family, which has held the same land for nearly 400 years. The fields now rotate between corn and grain crops. The Turner family owned the farm on the left-hand side of the road during the 19th century. If you look past the fields on your right, you can see the Patuxent River. Tobacco was a crop that used tremendous amounts of nutrients from the soil. As opposed to rotating crops, new fields would be constantly cleared and planted or the same field used over and over again until the soil was depleted. On your right, 1.7 miles from the turn on Domekel, is a small house that was built as a school that served white children in the neighborhood. It was called Wallville School, as this area was known as Wallville. The school for African-American children, also called the Wallville School, was about one mile to the north and has been reconstructed in Prince Frederick. The Calvert County Schools were finally integrated in 1966. Helen Gray tells a harrowing story of her school day and the work that came after it. And I had to get on and go and make a fire to school. Go get water and put in the school because you had to run water then. Bring back, let the fire get hot, cut the stove down, go back home, do my work, and get dressed and walk back to the school. Hmm? People are blessed now. We had miles to walk to school, get wet, wind blowing, you get in the school because it's so cold in there. Some, some days, till the teacher get her bell, said, let's go to the pond and skate to keep warm. Huh? It was so cold, we couldn't write. And the school was just like you had took the wind. The wind come through that snow blowing rain. You stand up around the stove, you ain't know the fire was in there. Huh? Now, people is blessed. Then after I get through, we get through like going to the tobacco bay, he came at 12 o'clock at night. You know where? When the clock, it's a Sunday night, when that clock hit 12 o'clock, he called you. Let's go. Take our light, take to the tobacco bay and sit on so we could have light, you know, to see how to draw the plants. Now when the sun coming up in the morning, we was back, going to field, had to plant all those plants out before we come and have breakfast. Hmm? <laughs> then the lady I worked for, she liked me. I was small, nine years old. So keep you at school some days. I go down and wash up, put on something clean, go down there and work. And. Uh, I get home night time, but two miles better. It'd be around 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the dark. Walking home. Huh. I worked for them people from nine years old up here in the 70s. That's family people. Good people. Just like my mother. To me. Sharecropping and tenant farming were tough ways of life. Listen to Wilson Perrin, former county commissioner, 
and Assistant Secretary at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources under Governor O'Malley as he talks about sharecropping from the sharecropper's point of view. I think it was a transition period. If you, if you look at what the country was going through, prior to that, you had slavery. I think the sharecropping arrangement was one step above slavery. Of course, in slavery, you had the slaves on the, on the farm, and the slaves did everything that actually the sharecroppers were doing. The, the, the difference was when the, the slaves were emancipated, what happened, some, of course, none actually had a place to go. Uh, one way, so what happened down south, a lot of the, the big plantation down south, they just released the slaves. Or, or they gave the slaves some land on their own and they actually farmed on their own. In Maryland, they, pre, they used the sharecropping to actually still use the slaves, if you will, to actually farm, give them a little money, give them some housing. Um, and when you look at that arrangement, at the, at, and at the time, it was when you didn't have any money starting out, when you didn't have a place to go, it was a way at least to get started. But it was also a system that kept you there. Unless you got out and you, and you, you worked construction, and as the kids got older, they went to college or, or better themselves through education, you were doomed to stay in that sharecropping process because, again, schools, most people dropped out of schools to work on a farm, and they only had enough education to work in their culture or on the farming environment as a, as a, a laborer uh, working on a farm. So I would say it was a system put together uh, to keep you in the system uh, until you actually figured out yourself how to, to make it better and get out of it. And it, it actually helped the people who didn't have housing that were willing to get in a sharecropping arrangement. Uh, and when I look at it, I'm wondering what would happen to a lot of these families if they didn't have that opportunity. They didn't own land. Uh, like I said, a lot of, some of the, uh, when the, the slaves were freed, some of the uh, approaches were different. Some sold land to slaves, you got in the sharecropping environment, you could actually buy yourself out at some point, buy some land, and then you actually were able to raise your own tobacco. And actually, once you raise your own tobacco and you got the whole amount, then you can see money coming. But without land, and land ownership is still a problem today. Without land ownership, you gotta depend on someone else to provide those resources for you. Uh, in the sharecropping environment, uh, when I look back on it, when I was in the middle of it, I didn't know whether it was fair or not. That's all I knew. Uh, you know, I didn't know whether what other people did. Most people I knew worked on these farms or actually they had uh, parents who actually had some drivers, uh, jobs as truck drivers and things like that. But that's all I knew. But looking back on it today, there are some things that I would question in, in, in that overall arrangement. Uh, was it actually a better way to do it? Was it a way to, you could have carved out the land, sold them the land, and then you actually hire them to raise the tobacco? Um, but when you look at that from a business standpoint, you didn't have a, a ready resource of labor all the time. And one of the reasons why you don't have sharecropping today is that you don't have the, the, the younger people who are willing to, to work in that environment to make it happen. Plus, of course, the other things that would happen to with tobacco. But the biggest thing I see is that in that sharecropping arrangement, it was an arrangement that guaranteed you had uh, uh, someone living there because if they didn't raise tobacco, if they didn't make that farm produce, they're out of there. And there were other people willing to come in. So, you know, you have to work to, to uh, actually keep the house that you lived in. The, the, there wasn't much interaction between the owner of the farm and the, the, uh, the sharecropper. The only interaction you had was when the owner of the farm picked up my dad when tobacco was sold at the tobacco market and they would go up together. I remember him getting in the back of the car and, and she was uh, she was a white lady, she was Ms. Lyons. She would be driving in the front and he, he would sit in the back. Was uh, there another passenger in the passenger no, seat? No. This, this was the 50s and you know, you, you not had a, a black man sitting up front with a white woman. 
So I remember him getting in the back of the car and, and driving up there, and he would come back, and he would have the money that uh, was split up. I'm not even sure that he even understood, you know, because he, he didn't go to school, whether the split up was fair or not, but he brought back about two or $300, and that was about it. Um, and he worked on, as I said, he worked construction. Uh, my mother managed most of the money. She managed most of the money because she could get the most, the most mileage from the little dollars that we did have. Bill Sansbury was sort of the, I would call, he was, I guess you would, the, day, the term today would be a manager of the farm, farms. Uh, I guess back in those days you called him an overseer. He was sort of the one who interacted between the, the owner of the farm and the, and the tenants, sharecroppers. And we saw quite a bit of him. He was a pretty good guy, uh, pretty personable. Uh, and I, I don't, really growing up back in the 50s, I don't recall any major conflicts because I guess what you don't know is what you don't know. You just know the environment which you lived in. Um, and that vi environment back then was that um, it was separate. It wasn't equal, but it was separate. Daniel Brown, a former tenant farmer, reflects on his pre-teenage youth. I was born October 3, 1916, and this is my home here in Calvert County. I was born right here in Calvert County. My uncle was the only blacksmith within this county, and he had a farm, and he sold half of my farm to my father, and the people around cut the timber out of the woods and turned it through the mill got the lumber and built a house to sell for my father and his friend. It was 1928. And that winter he died. After my father, after he come there and say the air property they had an auction sale and sold it. You know, back a long time ago, black really wasn't supposed to do it live and live close to the roads. Dirt road at one time, they had to build back. Anyway, they said it was air property. Didn't owe nobody nothing on it. Had an auction sale and sold our farm for seven hundred dollars. The man that bought my bought my, uh, our place was named Mr. Soper, and I had to work for Mr. Soper for three dollars a month in order the rest of my sister and brothers to stay in this house, which would be lost to us because they take it from us. He he didn't pay me. I didn't get paid. I put it to three dollars a month. Only thing that I he gave me milk away and Babe Ruth candy come out and. Uh, 39. I got a bar of uh, big roof candy. And he had this old big house over there. I, I had to sleep in the shed. But in the wintertime, I slept in a cot in the kitchen. I had good food to eat. Eat the same food that they had. But I had money. I didn't, I didn't get any money. Then when I got there, they wouldn't let me go to school. The children, I, I can remember the children walking around there to go walk over to Papa in school, and they would say, come on, Dad, go to school. And he would say, oh, what are you going to school for? You ain't going to be nothing. Helen Gray talks about what she calls renting. We were writing back in those years. Just like you say, you rent an apartment or whatever. We were writing, and we could farm on the land where we was writing, see. We worked on the farm, half and half, in them years. And we raised tobacco on the main lane. He could have, and we could have. See, that's where it was years back. Yeah, be surprised. Come a long ways, honey, long way. We ain't get nothing much, then back of us. Ten and a pound bottle of tobacco. Nickel. Quarter for the best. You can sell it at the market in Baltimore. You just have to pack it down in hogs back at it and ship it to Baltimore. They had trucks hauled it to Baltimore, else hauled it to Steamboat. We'll go back to Baltimore. Oh well, anybody could rent people farm then and need somebody to have them working. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's all I was do. And they had houses on it for the tunnels, you know, to live in. And they sheer crop. Had people cash money for rent. Sheer crop. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's all people could do to make a living was farm. Farm, that's all. And I mean, the place will grow up, you had to take holes and dig the bush and things before you could plant crop child. I done did some cutting <laughs> and grubbing <laughs> and a little bit of everything in my days. Folks like Helen Gray and Daniel Brown persevered as best they could and found joy in their lives. 